find the difference quotient for f of x equals to 3 over x, right? The quantity 3 over x. All right, number one, difference quotient. Let's write down the formula, okay? The, the difference quotient formula, equal. that's going to be uh, f of x plus h minus f of x divided by the quantity h. Well, in this case, what do we need to do? So number one, We need to, we need the original function, 3 over x plus h, that is, whatever you see, the letter x right here replace with x plus h. And then we're going to subtract the original function f of x, which is just like this, 3 over x. And then divide the whole thing by h, all right? And that looks a whole lot like something we did when we revealed all about rational expression. That looks like a complex rational expression that we need to simplify. So again, what we do is uh, simplify one rational expression on the side and then go back and write the final result. All right, let me do, let me do that on the side. That is 3 over x plus h minus 3 over x, and I'm right, and I'm leaving a space in, the, in between these two fractions in order to come up with a common denominator. We cannot combine these two fractions together because we don't have a common denominator. We need to find a common denominator. So by multiplying numerator and denominator of each rational expression by the missing factor. So this fraction, the first one, has an x plus h that the second fraction doesn't have. And the second fraction has an x that the first fraction doesn't have. So let's multiply numerator and denominator by x on the first fraction, multiply by x plus h, in the numerator and the denominator of the second of the second fraction. Let's put all these together into one single fraction. Okay, let's see, let's go back. Let me continue below, because I need the space over here. And well, that'll be three over x plus, or rather. Okay, let me do okay, one big fraction with x times x plus h. And then in the numerator, what are we going to have? 3x minus 3x plus h. Let's then simplify the numerator. So we'll leave the denominator alone, but we keep writing it down. All right. <clears throat> That'll be, so 3x minus, minus 3x minus 3h in the numerator. And that's divided by x times x plus h, right? We can see we can we can cancel out these three x's, and that's going to leave us with negative three h over x times x plus h. All right. So we have that fraction in the numerator fully simplified. Let's go back to the original problem in here. Okay. Let's go over here. That'll be. Okay, that'll be 3x, I mean 3, negative 3h, divided by x times x plus h. I'm going to put brackets around to delimit the division. This whole thing, which is the result of simplifying this fraction, gets divided by the quantity h. And remember, dividing by a number, dividing by a quantity here, it's the same. Well, this essentially means, rather, negative 3h over x times x plus h means division by h. That's what it means. It's division. And again, remember KFC rule, keep, flip, change. Keep the first fraction. Yes. 
flip the second fraction and change the division into a multiplication and then just multiply across. That'll be negative 3h divided by hx times x plus h. And then from here, notice how we can divide out the h's and this will be negative 3 divided by the quantity x times x plus h. And that is the difference quotient for the function f of x equals to 3 over x. All right? Now, you might wonder, well, why are we doing all this? Well, it turns out that we, when, well, when you get to calculus, when you compute this difference quotient to, to go the extra mile to find the derivative of the function and all that, uh, let's see, um, it turns out you will have to evaluate this quantity at zero, but do you see this h equal to zero? That causes a zero in the denominator, which makes the quantity undefined. And well, that's why our goal is to divide out the zero that's causing the zero over zero in the numerator and the denominator. All right. <clears throat> All right. However, when you set the f of x plus h, that is everywhere you see the letter x replaced with x plus h. Some of you wrote it like uh, 2 over x squared plus h over here. That's not correct. Some of you wrote it like 2 over x squared plus h. That's not correct either because we're changing the x with the entire x plus h quantity. And that's what we did almost at the beginning of the semester when evaluating functions at different numerical values, at different numerical values times uh, a letter, at different combinations of numbers and letters. Well, it applies the same thing here. So when we do f of x plus h minus f of x, that'll be over oh, the whole thing over h. And that equals to 2 over the quantity x plus h quantity squared minus 2 over x squared, and then the whole thing divided by the quantity h. And that big humongous expression in the numerator, let's take it on the side and simplify it first. All right. And let me use a different color just so you can see this is really more like a side trip here. So that'll be 2 over x plus h squared. I'm going to leave a space for missing factors here minus 2 over x squared equal to. Okay, missing factors. You want to make sure that your, uh, that your fraction has uh, all denominators with the same quantity. Well, this is an x plus h quantity squared. This is just an x squared. Well, let's interchange them. That is, multiply numerator and denominator by x squared, multiplying numerator and denominator by x plus h, the whole thing squared. All right, now that we have a common denominator, how about we continue by writing one big fraction with a new denominator, a common denominator of x squared times x plus h, quantity squared. Multiply across 2 times x squared, that's just 2x squared, no problem, minus 2 times the quantity x plus h, quantity squared. And be careful with how we simplify this, uh, the numerator. Well, number one, any ideas about how to simplify the next quantity in the numerator? Or what would you do next? You x plus h squared. x plus h squared. How do we simplify that x plus h squared? It will be x squared plus x, x squared plus 2xh. That is correct. It's a binomial square in this case. So be careful because a lot of you on the exam, you got the following. You distributed the 2 inside, which is not possible because here we have that exponent that has to go first. All right? Well, so let's see. 2x squared minus 2 times x squared plus... 2xh plus h squared. 
Okay, that's the simplification of the binomial squared. Uh, let me do it instead below. Over here. And then the whole thing divided by x squared times x plus h, quantity squared. And don't, don't simplify the quantity in the denominator. Just work with the numerator. You'll see why. Well, that's going to be, uh, what's that? 2x squared minus 2x squared minus 4xh minus or 2h squared. And then the whole thing divided by x squared times x plus h squared. So let's cancel a lot of the terms in here. Canceling a lot of the terms, that's going to give us, okay, cancel out 2x squared minus uh, 2x squared. And that's going to leave us with the quantity negative 4xh minus 2h squared over the quantity x squared times x plus h squared. And well, now we're going to go back to the original problem. The original problem, oh, so that equals to, okay, the numerator becomes negative 4xh minus 2h squared divided by the quantity x squared times x plus h, quantity squared. Okay, that's just the numerator, and I'm going to put a bracket and then divide the whole thing by h. That h that came from the difference quotient formula. All right? <clears throat> so that's the same as saying negative 4xh minus 2h squared divided by x squared times x plus h squared divided by the quantity h minus 4xh minus 2h squared divided by the quantity x squared times x plus h times division. Turn the product into a division by, again, that, that KFC rule. Boom. All right? So multiply across negative 4xh minus 2h squared divided by, multiply across the denominator, x squared h times x plus h. And well, notice how in the numerator, again, that's going to take us back to our factoring techniques, factor out the h in the numerator. Actually, we can factor out something other than just the h. We can factor out the negative, the 2, and the h, which is going to leave us with 2x. And then plus uh, just a quantity h. And then in this case, well, that's x squared times h times x plus h. And I forgot a square here. Square, square, squared. And that equals to, see how this h over h get canceled. And leaving us with negative 2x plus h over x squared times the quantity x plus h, quantity squared. And that's our final result for which one? The two in the front. Oh, yeah, yeah, the two. Oh, yeah, that should be parentheses, right? And, oh, I see, I see, I see. Two, negative two times two x plus h, right? Yeah. And that's final answer. All right, as you can see, these kind of problems, the difference quotient is very high, it's very involved in algebra. That's why we spend the whole, this whole three weeks reviewing a lot of it, everything we need to just getting into this exercise and be able to succeed in this kind of uh, challenges when you see them in the homework, on a quiz, or an exam, you name it. All right? Let's do another one. Uh, let me on another page. Um, find the difference quotient for f of x equals the square root of x. Now, You'll see why did we go back to review everything about radicals, all right? So, okay, so number one, f of x equals to uh, the square root of x. That means the quantity f of x plus h 
go and replace this x with x plus h, everything inside the radical. Square root of f of x plus h. So let's set up our difference quotient here. All right, <clears throat> that is gonna be, so f of x plus h minus the quantity f of x, the whole thing divided by h. All we're gonna do is set up the quantity square root of x plus h minus the original function f of x, which is the square root of f of, uh, the square root of x, the whole thing divided by h. All right, <clears throat> and it looks like, oh, we're done, because uh, it doesn't seem like we can do anything, because if we think of these two radicals in the numerator, those two radicals are not like radicals, because uh, well, even though they have the same index, they don't have the same quantity inside, so they are not like radicals, all right? And we can, and thus we can subtract those two together. So, and well, can we divide out the h? Well, again, so these are terms, not factors, okay? So no, we can't do that. Uh, well, so that's the reason we went back to review how to rationalize numerators. So what we're going to do is, check this out, multiply numerator and denominator by the conjugate of the numerator. In this case, we have a plus, well, a minus rather, we change it to a plus, but we do that in both numerator and the denominator. That is, plus root of x, plus root of x. All right. Keep in mind, this is parentheses, okay? So number one, first, the first thing you want to do is to multiply across. Multiply across without distributing yet, not yet. Okay? So that's going to be equal to, what's that? Let's see. Hmm. Uh, the square root of x plus h minus the square root of x times the square root of x plus h plus the square root of x. Close parentheses, divide the whole thing by whatever we get by multiplying across, but again, don't distribute, you'll see why. h equals, I mean h times the square root of x plus h plus the square root of x. And close the parentheses. Again, I know what you might be thinking, you want to distribute the h, but check this out. Our goal is to cancel the h right here. And check this out. I make more space in here. Uh, I would like you to see this pattern again, once again. That's why we do the a minus b times a plus b, which equals some kind of a squared minus b squared. Take advantage of this uh, backwards difference of squares because, I mean, if it works for you, distribute root of x plus a plus h times itself, root of x plus h times root of x, root of, negative root of x times this, root of x plus h, and negative root of x times uh, root of x. That's going to take you a couple more minutes, maybe, and it's going to look a lot, lot messy. In this case, just take advantage of the a minus b, a plus b, or a plus b times a minus b, and simply square the quantity a minus square the quantity b and divide the whole thing by h times the square root of x plus h plus the square root of x. Okay, and again, recall from properties of radicals how that square canceled with the index, that square canceled with the index, and that's gonna leave us with the following. That's uh, simply x plus h minus x, the whole thing divided by h times the square root of x plus h plus x, I mean, plus the square root of x, and see how these terms go away. These two terms, x minus x, and that's gonna leave us with the quantity h in the numerator divided by h times the square root of x plus h plus the square root of x. 
and see how 8 over 8 that leaves us with 1 over the square root of x plus h plus the square root of x. Final answer. That's the most simplified uh, difference quotient for the function square root of x. All right, I'll let you try another one. I'll let you try the next one. You try for f of x equals, let's do the square root of x plus 3 and see what you get. So number one, f of x equals to f of e equals the square root of x plus 3. That means f of x plus h replace every instance of x with x plus h and then keep writing the 3. When setting up this difference quotient, this will be, okay, f of x plus h minus f of x and the whole thing divided by 2. So that's going to be the square root of x plus h plus 3, all right, minus the original function f of x plus, I mean, square root of x plus 3, and then divide that by, not, not by 2, by h, actually. All right. <clears throat> All right, well, if we're going to work with the same rationalizing the numerator. However, this one is going to look a little nastier because it has three terms inside of the radical. But it doesn't matter whether it has three terms, five terms, 17 terms. We, it works the same way, All right? Multiply numerator and denominator by the conjugate of the numerator, in this case, uh, let me do green. That is, square root of x plus h plus 3, the whole thing inside the radical, because this is minus, the root of plus, that's uh, the square root of x plus 3, and then divide by same quantity, x plus h plus 3, plus the square root of x plus 3. Now, uh, let's see. <clears throat> so, again... Okay, let me whoops, make more space so you can see the pattern. Again, check this out. This looks like A minus B times A plus B. All right. This should be some kind of a difference of squared, something like uh, some A squared minus B squared. Let's set it up. All right. That'll be square root of x plus h plus 3 minus square root of x plus 3 oops, squared squared and the whole thing just multiply across h times the square root of x plus h plus 3 plus the square root of x plus 3 so number one cancel radicals with Squares, radical with square, radical with square. But be careful with the next result. For the next result, check how we'll, we will get, okay, the quantity x plus h plus 3 minus parentheses. That minus will change or rather affect everything inside of the parentheses. That is x plus 3. The denominator remains the same. Uh, so that'll be h times the quantity square root of x plus h plus 3 plus the square root of x plus 3. And then from here, okay, x plus h plus 3 remains the same. Minus x minus 3, the whole thing divided by all this madness here, h times the square root of x plus h plus 3 plus the square root of x plus 3. And check how we're going to cancel a lot of terms. Number one, cancel the x's, cancel the h's, oh, not the h's, hold on, the threes rather, and that's going to leave us with h times, h times the, divided by h times the square root of x plus h plus 3, 
square root of x plus 3. And let's divide out the h's, and in the end, that's going to leave us with 1 over square root x plus h plus 3 plus square root of x plus 3. All right? This is the kind of stuff you guys are going to do in calculus when you get to Math 150, week 1 or week 2, I'm pretty sure. And again, you're going to do it next semester when you get to Math 141, right? So, so in a way, it's a, good, it's a good thing that you take this class like as a 104, using the same textbook, actually. The same section, you will see repeats of these sections in Math 141. So you reinforce everything you were doing here. So when you get to calculus, you will be so ready to go about it. All right, I think we're, but we're, we're in a good moment to go back to uh, what was next. Okay, so we finished, uh, we finished the difference quotient. So now let's find the domain of a function defined by an equation. All right, so. Uh, go back, going back to functions, finding the domain. Well, so um, we already did a little bit of finding domains and ranges of functions, but in this case, from graphs, you know, uh, remember, you might remember how we scan a graph from left to right to get the domain and from bottom to top to get the range. So that's one thing we did. Another thing we did, maybe uh, sets of order pairs, you know, the x values of all the order pairs represented the elements in the domain and the y values represented the elements in the range, all right? However, we haven't gotten to finding the domain of a function defined by an equation, a polynomial, a radical, a rational expression, and that's where what we're going to do today. All right, and well, you can always think of, of, the, of finding the domain as the OK inputs in a, in a, in, in a function, you know, and you may have seen this, um, this approach, the machine approach. Okay. So let's think of a machine. Input that is x equals, for instance, x equals to 1. All right? And some function f of x, the machine will process this input of, well, let me make, let me make it more interesting, 4. Let me do 2x plus 3, for instance. All right, so we input something in the machine. The machine is going to process this 4. What is that going to do with the 4? Oh, it's going to multiply it by 2 and then add 3 units to it. That's going to give us a result of how much is that? 2 times 4 is 8 plus 3. Y equals 11, all right? However, there are some functions or some machines that may have restrictions, you know? Uh, let, let, me, let me see what's next. Okay, the next one. Okay. So, for instance, in this case, polynomials. Polynomials uh, have, or have a domain of all real numbers. So, domain T, in this case, it's uh, all real numbers. Because, in this case, you can think, you can think of every... Every single, every single value and substitute it in a polynomial, a negative number, a positive number, zero. In this case, the, since we don't have any x's in the denominators, that's not going to give you an undefined value. We don't have radicals that can give us the, neg the, the, the square root of a negative number. So polynomials, all real numbers, that's in, set, in interval notation and in set builder notation x belongs to the set of all real numbers, all right? Okay, but what about this function right here? What about letter b? It turns out we are going to have a more restricted domain. Okay, for instance, let's see. Let me, let me input some values so you can see the concept behind. For instance, let me do h of 1. Okay, let's see, what, let's determine whether the function at h of x equals to 5x over x squared minus 9 is defined, but it's defined for x equals to 1. What do we do? 5 times 1 over 1 squared minus 9, that equals to 5, 
divided by negative 8. In this case, 1 minus 9 is negative 8. So we got a number. For that input, the machine crosses the number 1 in accordance with this function, with this rule, and the output was negative 5 over 8. All right? And then let's try 0. Okay, h of 0. That is uh, 5 times 0 over, what's that? 0 squared minus 9. 5 times 0 in the numerator is 0 over negative 9. And what do we get when we divide 0 by negative 9? Let's just say negative 0. 0, just 0. Well, I mean, well, there's no such thing as positive or negative 0. 0 is just 0. What I mean, I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. All right? Okay, so that the 0 is an OK input for this machine, for this function. All right? Now, check this out. What about h of 3? h of 3, let's do 5 times 3, divided by 3 squared minus 9. 5 times 3 equals to 15 in the numerator. And in the denominator, that's, uh, that's what? 3 squared, which is 9, minus 9. What is that equal to? Zero. What do we get when we divide 15 by 0? zero. Hmm? Undefined. Undefined. Oh. That means the number 3 is not in the domain of the function because it's giving us an undefined value. And if we think of the machine approach, uh, essentially that number 3 is causing, the is causing the machine to blow up because it's outputting an undefined value. And well, when it comes to find the OK inputs for a function, that is the domain of a function, let's think of a, let's think of a coffee maker. What are, what are the OK inputs in a coffee maker? Coffee grounds. Coffee grounds. OK, that's one. What else? Water. Water. What else? Filter. The filter. What else? Nutmeg. Spicy. All right, nutmeg. All right. Yes, that's good. What else? How about some cinnamon? Pumpkin spice, yes. How about some cinnamon, maybe? Yeah, that makes it taste really good. Uh, what else? What would you put on a coffee machine? Hmm? What was that? Did you say water? Yeah, I already said water. How about chocolate? Actually, if you shred chocolate, no, but I, mean, I don't mean like the chocolate bar, like the Mexican chocolate, you shred it like the abuelita or the barra, you know, you shred it, and it's actually, well, that's actually the basis for the mocha, which is chocolate based, and it tastes really good. What else? What is that? What is it? Like grind up like chili peppers. All right, to make it a little spicier, yes? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, well, actually, many of the chocolates are made with, with chili, so that uh, actually would give it a very interesting taste. Okay, let's see. What if I add gasoline to the coffee machine while it's on? It's going to blow up. It's going to explode, right? It's going to blow up. It's the same thing here. When I'm, okay, this is the water. Okay, it's, giving, it's, it's, it's outputting something. Hot water. Zero, maybe that's the ground coffee. Okay, that's a zero. But this is the gasoline. The three here is the gasoline, and it's giving us an undefined value. The function is blowing up. All right, so that's what we call restricted values. However, uh, we don't have time to test every single value of x for a function and find out which of them are the red flags in this case. No, there is a process to do that. And in this case, what we do, set the denominator equals zero and solve the equation for the variable. In this case, well, we have x, right? So I'm not, I don't want to say just x because what if I change the variable for, for a y, you know, or for an m, an r, or an s? No. So it's not all, the variable is not always x, okay? And, well, those, so the solutions to the equation 
will be the restricted values. All right, let's see. So what we do, set this quantity, the denominator, x squared minus nine, set it equal to zero, and solve for the variable x, which in this case, okay, let me move, x squared equals to nine. And how do we get x by itself for this equation? What do we do? Add nine, mm -hmm. Add nine and then square root. Okay, so x equals the square root of nine which equals x equals to three. Do we all agree with this? Exactly, so we do, every time we do the square root property, we do plus minus, plus minus, the square root of three. We mean the square root of nine, which equals to three. So those are the two numbers that we cannot input to that function because that's gonna give us an undefined value. In other words, it's going to blow up. It's like, again, it's like adding the gasoline to the coffee machine. Boom, it's gonna go up, it's gonna blow up, right? Okay, we need to represent this using both uh, interval notation and set builder notation. Now, uh, it would be a great idea to first draw a graph, that is, uh, not the graph of the function rather, but uh, just a number line, and write open circles for these two numbers, because those are the two numbers that we will exclude from the domain. And those should be represented with open bubbles, that is, negative three, three, that's the real number line. And essentially, what we do is to shade. Everything except where we have these two holes, where we have these two restricted values. This is gonna be, this is gonna help us visualize how to write the interval notation for this function. That is, well, the first arrow which is coming, for, which is going to the left, uh, that's indicating that, we, that it's coming from negative infinity, and then goes all the way to negative three, and then at negative three we have to jump the hole to keep going, that is close parentheses, union, open parentheses, negative three, to three, union, and then three to infinity. So that's our domain using interval notation. Now, for the set builder notation, it's a lot easier to write it down because all we do is x such that x cannot be negative three, comma, x cannot be three. So you, that means, the, what, what the way we interpret this set builder notation is that we can <coughs> input every value of x you can think of except negative three or positive three, and we already saw an example here with the positive three, all right? That means we, if we put the negative three and the positive three, it's gonna give us a zero in the denominator, and that's going to make the machine blow up. That is the function blow up to an undefined value. All right. Okay, so, and also the interval notation, the way we read it, oh, we come from negative infinity, but if we get to negative three, we need to jump, go from negative three to three, jump, and then go all the way to infinity. All right. Letter G, I mean, letter C, which is G of X equals to X squared plus nine. And in this case, we have, a, we have another rational expression. We have, uh, a, a potential zero in the denominator. Let's let's go through the process of setting the denominator equal to zero, and see if we are going to have any restricted values in here. That is, x squared plus nine. Set it equal to zero. Okay, same, solve, x squared equals to negative nine, and then x squared equals to plus or minus the square root of negative nine. The question is, can we take the square root of a negative number? That's not a real number.
Not a real number, not no real numbers. In this case, well, that means no restrictions. Means no restrictions. So you can put, so this is maybe a special coffee maker that you can input gasoline and it's not going to blow up, right? So domain, negative infinity to positive infinity or using set builder notation, x belongs to the set of all real numbers. We need to be able to write both notations again, interval notation and also the set builder notation. All right. <clears throat> So that was one example. So what do we have? We have a, a polynomial function. We have a, a couple of rational functions for which we don't want those denominators to be zero. What about the case in which the, um, uh, what's it called, in which the, we have a radical function? Well, again, as discussed earlier last week or during the last couple of weeks when we when we talk about about we talk about radicals, so we took we took the square root of zero, which is zero. We took the square root of a positive number, but again, can we take the square root of a negative number? No. Okay. That means. Okay. Cannot. Cannot take the square. square root of of a negative number. So we're gonna take the square root of a negative number, which means we need we need to exclude negative numbers. from the domain. To do so, or to do this, set the radicand greater, and this is key, set it greater than or equal zero and solve the inequality. Of course for the variable could be x, could be y. Well, I just that's why I just write it as solve it for the variable, not solve for x, not solve for y. All right. So that'll be okay. So what we do is let me highlight only uh, the radicand. Be careful because the radicand it's only the quantity that is inside the radical, not the whole thing without the radical symbol. That's what the radicand is. So, that's uh, 4x minus 6, set it greater than or equal to 0. This is how we exclude the negatives from the domain, by finding for which values of x we get this greater than or equal to 0. We don't want those negatives as well, because otherwise that's going to cause trouble and it's going to make the function blow up to an undefined value. All right? So that'll be, uh, let's add six to both sides for x greater than or equal to six. And what else? Uh, x greater than or equal to six over four, which reduces to x greater than or equal to three halves, all right? And to, to, uh, to illustrate the domain for this function, you might want to use uh, a number line first, okay? So that means, 
And then in, in this case, because it includes the, we have the equal in the equality symbol, that means open circle as opposed to if we had the greater than only, that would have been representing just an open circle. So in this case, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to do an open circle at three halves. All right. And then from here, okay. The question here is, should we shave to the left of three house or to the right of three house? To the right, okay? So let's shade to the right. And what is this? Well, that means, so from here we can already describe the domain, which I'm going to call D. That's from three halves. But because we have greater than or equal, we use brackets, comma, all the way to infinity. So that's the domain using interval notation. And for the set builder notation, just write this x greater than 3 halves inside a set. That is, x such that x is greater than or equal to 3 halves. So the two notations. The the, uh, what you call the interval notation and set builder notation. All right, uh, so every time we have a radical function, I mean, all we do is just write down the quantity inside the radical and set it greater than or equal to zero to find the, the domain in what well, we get an inequality represented by a number line, and then from there, write down the interval notation and set builder notation. However, things can go a little tricky at times because, well, yes, we have a radical, a radical term, but in this case, that radical is in the denominator, all right? However, there's a combination of the last two type of function. Number one, yes, we don't want that radical in the denominator to be negative, right? But because the radical is in the denominator, can the radical also be zero? What happens if the denominator is zero? We can divide by zero, so somehow we need to exclude the negatives and also zero because it's in the denominator here. So let's see. This guy, x plus three, you would think of you would think of the following, x minus 3 greater than or equal to 0 because it's a radical, right? That's the, that's the first thing you might think about. Now, side note, but cannot equal 0 because The denominator would equal zero. So change this inequality then to instead of x minus three greater than or equal to zero, just make it greater than zero. All right, without the equal. All right. So let's solve this baby inequality for x. That's add to three to both sides x greater than 3. Now, how do we represent this x greater than 3 using an upper line? The same way we did the x greater than or equal 3. Halves, we're going to represent the x greater than 3, but without the equal, how do we represent the, the, the greater than only? Well, with, in this case, an open circle at 3. And in this case, let's shade. Let's shade. In this case, do we shade to the right or to the left of the open circle? Hmm? To, the right. to the right, right? I mean, again, the inequality symbol tells us the direction in which we, in which we go. All right, so that's going to help us write down the domain using interval notation that is from 3 to infinity. But in this case, parentheses for the 3 because uh, it has an open circle as opposed to the previous case in which we have a full circle. Okay. Writing this down using 
interval notation x such that x greater than 3. Essentially, the result you got from solving the inequality, put it inside curly braces and the correct uh, set builder notation. All right? Okay, so for letter F, what we have the square root of 3x plus 12 divided by the quantity x minus 5. All right, so here is where we are going to combine uh, two different techniques. Number one, the radical in the denominator cannot be negative, in the numerator cannot be negative because if, if it's a negative, that's going to give us not a real number and an undefined value. Also, we have a potential red flag in the denominator. That is, if we plug in x equals to 5, that 5 minus 5 is going to give us a 0 in the denominator. However, we are going to combine two procedures in the same one. Number one, okay, let's call this letter A and let's call this letter B. We're going to do two sets at a time. That is, for letter A, For letter A, what we do is set the 3x plus 12 greater than or equal to 0 and solve the inequality for the variable. That is, subtract the 12 from both sides. That's going to be 3x greater than or equal to negative 12 and then divide both sides by 3 to get x greater than or equal to negative 4. All right, so that's one, that's one, uh, one of the results. Now let's do the letter B. The letter B part, we don't want the denominator to be zero. That is, we want to make sure that um, for letter B, uh, x minus 5, set it equal to zero, x equals to 5, and that's, uh, that's the number that should be restricted, all right? Because again, if the denominator you plug in 5, 5 minus 5, that's going to give us zero. So... Uh, restricted value. All right, so what are we going to do in this case? Well, since in this case we have a combination of the two rules, the radical rule and the rational or the denominator rule, if you will. So we need to, uh, we need to write, to represent this using two sets. So in this case, uh, set a well let's have the zero in the middle let's have the zero in the middle and in this case well here is the thing for set a let's call set a and b set a it's all the numbers greater than or equal to negative four so i'm going to go from negative four i'm going to do a solid bubble and then in this case because of the inequality symbol greater than or equal what does that mean? Should we shake to the right or to the left of negative 4? To the right. Let's go for it. All right. And I'm going to use different colors to shade this. Let me use blue over here. All right. Now, we need to be careful with the representation for the exclusion of x equals to 5. Okay, let me, let me put it here using instead uh, an open circle. So 5 is here. That means we can substitute anything for the denominator except 5. So <clears throat> let me use a different color for this. That'll be, okay, no, highlighter. So everything here except where we have that hole and well because that hole right here represents what? Uh, the restricted value. And remember how we did these compound inequalities? How in some cases we did the union, in some cases we did the intersection, the overlaps of, of the colors? Well, this is what we did that review for so we can look at the overall domain of a, of a function just like this. All right, so now uh, let's do, let's do, let's get the overlaps in this case. That is, let's make a sandwich with this, the intersection of these two sets. Will be the overall domain on the one hand. Well, let me put a full circle here. So let's go shade in this case, shade everything. 
that's the one in red and then let me do the blue for the other part so in this case oh let me jump here only the overlaps will be the domain the okay inputs for this very special machine so this that very special machine has even a weird way to restrict these values number one we need to express this with one interval right here whoops and then another interval right there again whatever is in common to both of the sets a and b that where, where we see the overlapping colors that's going to be the domain of our function in this case let's write them down right here using interval notation first so domain then will be using interval notation notice the opens the full circle for what was that again negative four right negative four negative four five okay between negative four and five but in this case notice for the five at five we have an open circle that means we need to exclude the 5 by putting parentheses around and then the union symbol, open parentheses 5. And then, well, do you see these overlapping colors? Do you see how it includes the arrow pointing all the way uh, forever? That means it's going to go to positive infinity. That's correct. All right, to write down the set builder notation for this one, it might be a little tricky. We need to write the two set representation or the two inequality way of these two. Number one, okay. So start by opening curly braces, x such that. Okay, what we do in this case is represent this interval from negative four to five using an inequality, uh, again, that's why we went back to review all the different ways to express an interval, an inequality, and then how do we, how do we bring down those inequalities into sets? Well, essentially, negative four, all the way to five, put an x in the middle, and well, in this case, because, it, because of bracket, that's greater than or equal, and then because of parentheses here, that's just less than only. And then, well, we're going to list this by a comma and then 5 to infinity. That's essentially x greater than 5, right? So between negative 4 and 5, inclusive, exclusive, inclusive, exclusive, <laughs> comma, 5 all the way to infinity, simply x greater than 5. That's how we write, all right? So that was another example of finding the domain of a function, all right? <clears throat> And here is one of those in which we uh, actually combine more than one rule at the same time. Okay, there's going to be a lot more different rules. You'll see those when we get to what's that? Uh, the trigonometric functions, the inverse trigonometric functions. You'll see how some of them are still going to be all real numbers. How some of them will have restricted values, like in cases that we have for. Uh, for what what's it called uh, the um, the rationals and the algebraic type of functions. Let's just call them like that more in general. All right. Let's see. So now that we have an idea of what we do with functions, you know, like evaluate a function at a numerical value, which is essentially uh, we have a function as a machine. We input a number. The machine is going to process the number and it's going to output a number. And again, those function values. Okay, let's go back real quick to this. Well, that ha those have different interpretations. For instance, well, when the input is x equals to 4, the output is y equals to y. These are actually points in the, uh, in the, in the, in the Cartesian plane that we can use to graph the function. Although we're not going to focus on graphing the functions yet, we will, but we will later. All right? So... There's a lot more we can do with functions. What else did we do? We computed the difference quotient, which is all this algebraic mess we did uh, a few, a few minutes, some in the previous couple sections of the lecture, and then what else? So now we're going to do what we usually call the algebra of functions. So in the same way that you can add numbers, 5 plus 3, 7 plus 7 minus 9, 5 over 7, okay, we're going to do the same with functions. Add functions, 
subtract functions, multiply functions, and divide functions. All right? Same operations, but with functions. We will do these operations with, it, with the function, but not just that. We will also compute, or rather find, the domains of the combined functions and, um, and, their, and the domains of the original function. So what, do, what are we going to do here? Okay. The domain of f plus g consists of the numbers x that are in the domains of both f and g. That is, the domain of f plus g, we're going to do uh, s intersection with g, which is the same way we did, in a way, the same thing we did with the previous example, right? Like, uh, uh, what was that again? The intersection, the overlaps of the two sets. <coughs> the, uh, the domain of the difference, it's exactly the same. It's just the difference in the domain is the overlap of the two sets. Number three, the domain of a, of a product between two functions will be uh, also the domains that are in that are overlapping for the two functions. However, in this case, uh, we are going to have a little trouble with the quotient because, well, number one, yes, we need to make sure that the denominator, the function, the, de the denominator function is not zero because you know why. Because if we divide by zero, we get undefined. That's not going to be a good function, a good machine. And then, well, so the domain of the func of the quotient of functions, number one, the denominator cannot be zero. And so that is the restricted values of G and the domain of F and the domain of G. So in this case, we will have a look at more sets and let them overlap. All right. I know this, uh, this definition box uh, has a lot of information. The, better, the best way, I guess, is just to see it in action with an example. All right. So let's see. Let f of x equals to 1 over x plus 2, and g of x be equals to x over the quantity x minus 1. All right. OK, find each of the following and determine the domain in each of in each of the cases. Okay, so for letter A, they are asking us to evaluate the addition of the functions, right? As the two functions, what are we going to do here? Well, number one. So notice how. Okay, let me highlight f of x equals to one over x plus two. That's our f of x, and g of x is x over x minus 1 all right so let's let's highlight in some with using some colors here okay let's just substitute the values that means in this case this will be number one uh, so what's that f of x which is 1 over x plus 2 plus g of x which is x over x minus 1 well, the, so that's essentially the first result, but guess what? We need to combine the fractions together. And again, this is the reason why we went back to review all of these algebraic methods, such as adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing fractions with variables so we can, uh, we, we're going to be doing the same over and over. All right? But number one, let's call this, let's call this letter A. And... And letter B. Why is that? Because we are going to represent this like set. All right, so letter A. Okay, letter A. Uh, how about we do this? Should I do it? Okay, let me do it here. I'm going to make more space in here. All right. So A, in this case, well, we have a rational function. Well, how do you think we should find the domain for 1 over x plus, for the 1 over x plus 2 part of the problem? For the domain? Yes. Uh, what do we set to 0? x plus 2. The x plus 2, the denominator, right? So in this case, x plus 2, set it equal to 0, that's x equals to negative 2, that'll be our, uh, our restricted value, all right? That's the first restricted value. For b, uh, 
uh, what do we do to get the domain for the B part? Same thing. Same thing. Set the denominator x minus one equal to zero. Add one to the to both sides. X equals to one. All right. So let's let's draw these two sets in one in one single picture. Well, actually one at a time. So uh, on the one hand, I'm gonna write uh, an, an open circle at negative two. and an open circle at positive one. All right, okay, so that's at negative two, that's at one. And well, this is again, um, set A and set B. Okay, so let me use the same colors to actually, uh, what's that, to, to shade the okay input. So in this case for set A, which I will shade with blue, that's everywhere except where we have the hole. And for, <clears throat> for B, same thing. We shade everywhere except where we have the hole as well at 1. That's at x equals to 1. Now, again, we're going to make a sandwich with these two sets. We're going to overlap these two sets and whatever is common to both, that is, whatever turns uh, the combination between red and blue, which is going to become, which is going to turn purple, that's, <coughs> that's going to be our domain. How that's going to be denoted, first of all, uh, what's that, A and B, A intersection B. Okay, so that's at negative 2, that's at 1, and that's going to be, okay, so... Uh, for the blue part, let's see, oh, highlighters first, okay, that's going to be everything but negative 2. <coughs> but again, here I will have to jump the second hole and keep shading. And for, uh, for set B, that is ev everything except... Oh, I will have to jump that negative 2 as well. So in this case, we need to express the domain of this function by observing the overlap. That is where the blue and the red uh, come together and turn purple. That's going to be our domain. And in this case, that will be, uh, well, using interval notation, we need to describe three sectors. This first sector, second sector, <coughs> three sectors separated by union symbols in this case. All right, so let's see. That'll be, okay, domain. Yes, the domain will be negative infinity to negative two. That's gonna be our first interval, our first, our first set, union. We will have to jump the negative two to keep going. That is a negative two all the way to one. Make another jump to keep going. Union from 1 to positive infinity and close the parentheses in here. So that's the interval notation. For the set builder notation, okay, again, open the curly braces. That's a lot shorter notation when it comes to this kind of uh, what they call a rational function. Well, that's because all we do is exclude these two values, that is the numbers that are representing the holes in this case. All right, so let's go ahead and do that. So, huh. yeah, anyway, so that's going to be x cannot be negative 2 and x cannot be 1. All right, because otherwise the machine is going to blow if you substitute either negative 1 or, or either negative 2 or positive 1. All right, so that's the end of finding the domain. Now, when you're working with these kinds of exercises in, in my math lab on the homework, um, they may not accept that as a final answer, so we need to do the algebra and simplify to one single quotient. And again, that's the reason why we went back to uh, review this um, addition and subtraction of rational exp uh, fra rational uh, expression. So x minus 1, x minus 1, x plus 2, 
x plus 2. So what we're doing here is multiplying numerator and denominator of each rational by those missing factors in a way that both terms now have the same denominator. Now we're good to go. Let's write one single big rational expression with a new common denominator x plus 2 x minus 1 and in the numerator just write 1 times x minus 1 that's simply x minus 1 plus the quantity x times x plus 2 and let's from here distribute the x that's going to be, well, x minus 1 plus x squared plus 2x. And divide that by x plus 2 times x minus 1. So the denominator, just leave it the way it is and just focus on simplifying the numerator. That's going to be, okay, combining like terms, x plus 2x, that equals to, okay, x squared plus 3x and then minus 1. The whole thing divided by x plus 2 times x minus 1. Final answer. And I know what you might be thinking. Oh, factor that trinomial in the numerator, maybe one of the factors of that trinomial in the numerator is x plus 2 or x minus 1. We can divide one out. However, if we try and factor this trinomial, OK, are there any factors of negative 1 that add up to positive 3? Yes, 3 and minus 1. But I mean factors of negative 1. So the only factors of negative 1 are negative 1 and 1. And so negative 1 times 1, well, that's going to be, be a 0, actually. Well, we need a 3. So we're good with this, all right? So that's one example. So that's, well, part A of the example. Let's do part B in the next page. OK, so for part B, they're asking us to find the, the, the domain, all right, number 1 the difference of the functions and also the domain of the difference, all right? So, let's see. For the difference, we're going to do same quantity, that is 1 over x plus 2, and then minus, let me leave some space for missing factors. Um, what is it? x over x plus 2. Okay, here is the thing. For the domain, I don't want to repeat myself for the domain. The domain same as in part A. X minus 1, right? Yes, x minus 1. Thank you. Okay, same as in part A. Because what are we going to do? Okay, check this out. What are we going to do? Uh, set x plus 2 equal to 0, x equals negative 2. Again, x plus 1 equals to 0. Set, set, uh, solve it. Solve for x. x equals to negative 1. Write the set. Draw the number lines. Make a sandwich out of it. We're going to get the same result, right? Nothing is changing here. So that's just, that's just about it, okay? So uh, just the main same as in part A. However, we are still going to combine the fractions together. That is x plus. Uh, x, it's a plus 1 or minus 1. It's minus 1, right? Yep. Minus 1. And, well, that's um, x, x minus 1 over x minus 1. x plus 2 over x plus 2. And again, now that we have multiplied by the missing factors, let's write everything as one big fraction with the least common denominator, x plus 2 times x minus 1. That is 1 times x minus 1. That's x minus 1 minus x times x plus 2. So it's going to be similar. However, we have a minus as opposed to having a plus. All right? So in this case, x minus 1 minus x squared, that is x times x and x times 2, that's um, minus 2x. And then x plus 2 times x minus 1. That's going to be reduced to, okay, number 1, negative x squared 
uh, x minus 2x, that's minus x, and then minus 1. Everything negative, by the way, in the numerator. And the whole thing divided by x plus 2 times x minus 1. All right? Uh, so that's, what's that? Uh, let's factor out the negative just to make it look nicer, I guess. So that'll be negative in the very front, x squared plus x plus 1. And again, try to factor that numerator using the double bubble method. And well, factors of one that add up to one, that's not possible, so there's not gonna be any factors in the numerator, and nothing is gonna get canceled in the denominator, so. So that's final answer right here, all right? Again, we still have to do the algebra between the functions, that is to write the addition or subtraction of these two baby rationals into one single quotient. The domain is just gonna be the same. We don't have to do the, the shadings one second time. And for part C, well, let's check, let's check part C. So for part C, It's the product, not the addition, not the subtraction, but the product this time. That'll be one over x plus two times the quantity one over x minus one. And again, check this out. If we call this our set A and our set B, so we can find the domain of each individual factor, do you notice that again, we have the same, one, the same x, the same restricted values, negative 2 and positive 1, so no need to uh, to do that whole thing again. So domain, same, same as in part A, all right? Same as in part A and also B, all right? Well, to simplify the pro, oh, it's an x in the numerator, right? It's, uh, of B, there's an x. So in, in this case, to write down the product, all we do is multiply 1 times x, which is simply x, and divide by x plus 2 times x minus 1. And there's really nothing to go and discuss any further about this one. There's not much to do. All right. <clears throat> okay. <coughs> What about letter letter D, the one in the very very bottom? Well, this one for this one we need to um, we need we need to work a little more about it. Number one, for the quotient between the function, that's going to be the quantity F divided by the quantity G. All right, let's go about it. That'll be uh, okay. The quantity F, which is one over x minus two. And the quantity G, which is X over X minus one, or plus two and minus one. And well, what is this? This is a complex rational expression. And again, this is the reason why we went back to review all of those, so we can, so you can see what we're gonna do next. However, first of all, do you know what? In this case, I'm going to, I'm going to rewrite the, the real line representations of the sets A and B, right? Let me label this as A and B. So that'll be the quantity A and that'll be the quantity B. So A and B will be, okay, number one, A. So that'll be, okay, we represented A with uh, negative two, an open circle at negative two. And what else? Uh, everything else, we were fine shading it. Part B, we restricted the number one with an open circle, right? And that's just about it. And well, so it turns out that there will be a third set that we will need to put together. Don't worry, these two are the same as, part, as in part A. You'll see how everything will get put together. So number one, uh, this is the same as saying one over x plus two divided by x over x minus one, which in this case is, uh, keep the same, the first fraction, 
in accordance with the KFC rule and then multiply by the reciprocal of the second fraction, x plus 1 over x, and put everything together. 1 times x plus 1 is simply x plus 1. And in the denominator, multiply these two across x times, uh, what's that, x plus 2, All right? Let me do this. Um, uh, x minus 1? Uh, yes. Um, x minus 1, yeah, yeah, minus 1. Yes, minus 1. And let me do the, the 1, like, over here, all right? A bit farther. I need, I need more space in here. Whoops. Oh, come on. There you go. Okay. So it turns out, now check this out. That's the result of finding the, uh, the, the quotient between the two, fun the two functions. Now in this case, coming back to the guidelines to find the domain of a quotient between two functions, that is, the domain of f, the domain of g, which we already put together back again as a and b. Now we need to look at the denominator of that whole new function we obtained. Okay, check this out. From, from here, uh, let's see, from, from here we get that x plus 2 equals to 0, x equals to negative 2, but we already take that into account, right? However, do you see this new factor of x? Okay, that factor of x will be x equals to 0, so that's going to be called uh, set C. So C will be 0, that's 1. And well, again, let me use different colors to shade this. Okay, and again, blue for the first one. <coughs> and red for the second component, or rather for the second set. And let me use a third color for, what's that? Uh, let me use green for, the, for that third new set. This one right here, right? Let me use green. And well, let's put this all together. So we're going to find the intersection of these three sets, all right? Okay, make a sandwich. When we do this sandwich, we're gonna have this open circle here this other open circle and this third open circle, one at negative two, the second one at zero, and the third one at one. And in this case, okay, let's, let me do one, one, one at a time. Let me do the, the blue one, that's from everything else uh, except negative two, but I have to jump the holes. And then purple. That's everything else except the holes. <coughs> and lastly, um, that's uh, three, the, 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 the set C rather. And in, in this case, the overlaps of the three actually just excluding the holes uh, that within every when we, put, when we put them together. Now, in this case, we need to represent the domain using four intervals, that is, one interval for this portion, a second interval for that portion, a third one for this one, and a fourth one for that last portion. So let's see. Domain. Domain, that's gonna be negative infinity to negative two. Union, negative 2 to 0. Union, 0 to 1. Union, 1 to infinity. And domain using set builder notation, x such that x cannot be number 1, cannot be negative 1, I mean negative 2 first, cannot be, x cannot be 0, and x cannot be positive one.
And that's how we find the domain of a more composite of, or a rather a more elaborate uh, function. And in this case, all we do is the overlap of all these sets and where the three colors uh, overlap, that's what we want for our domain. All right? 